These three former admissions officers have been asked to evaluate this biochem student's college applicant profile, just like how they would do in a real IvyWise roundtable session. Hi everyone, my name is Eric. I am a counselor at IvyWise and former admission officer at Columbia University as well as the new school in Lower Manhattan. I would say that I describe my counseling style as pretty direct but also with some important levity thrown in. I know that this is an intense and high pressure, high stakes process for a lot of students, so helping them preserve their voice and authenticity and interest in the uh, college admission process is really of particular importance to me. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm an admissions counselor with Ivy Wise. I worked formerly at the admissions office at Swarthmore College and also as an applicant reader for North Northeastern. Uh, my counseling style, I would say generally pretty supportive. Um, I try to bring a little bit of humor here and there when appropriate, um, bring in the whole family to really make sure everybody's on the same page and of course, lots of deadline management so we can make sure that nobody gets surprised and we're always on track. Hi, I'm Katie, a counselor with Ivy Wise, and I'm a former admissions officer at MIT. And my counseling style is that I am in the boat with you, helping to point out landmarks along the way. I'm helping point out opportunities you might wanna take advantage of and supporting you in doing the hard work of uh, actually rowing the boat. And our first profile we're going to discuss is a student who is an aspiring biochemist, uh, lead guitarist in their own rock band, and has worked to design neural networks uh, to help the city improve the traffic. Just a casually accomplished young person, right? Making me feel lazy as usual. Katie, what do you think about the student's course selection and their academic profile, given what some of their college aspirations are? Great question. Um, so given that the student is in the British system, they've already selected their A-levels and they're in A-level chemistry, A-level biology, and A-level history. If I were picking their A-levels again, I probably would have added a math in as an A-level. For someone who's interested in going into the STEM fields, having that math is very important. Sorry certainly something that I look for uh, for students coming to MIT. Uh, but nonetheless, the history is still a really nice way to round out that curriculum. Um, and as long as they're doing well, they're uh, going to have some great options out there. Nice. Um, Rachel, did anything stand out to you among the students' profile? I know they're super impressive, but like certain things that maybe stand out in your mind? You know, I was interested to see that history was one of the um, A-levels that they chose and actually excited by the interdisciplinary options that that might present. And I noticed that one of the um, schools that they're interested in is Johns Hopkins. And I thought as um, with some interdisciplinary options there, having an interest in history um, could bring, like Katie said, some well-roundedness. From a liberal arts perspective, I really love how this student has um, some really strong STEM interest, but also mentions an interest in philosophy, an interest in history, a desire to attend Columbia because of those programs. I think there is some real intention around what they're looking at. Um, and I think there are some places really across the country that they could find opportunities to maybe bring all those things together or to study them individually. But a liberal arts school would really be something to consider. I also really want to shout out the level of impact that I feel like this student has had working within like kind of high level, um, almost city government. Um, I can see admissions officers being really excited about that initiative and impact. And it would be great to see um, the academic piece really rise to complement that as well. Absolutely. I like that, Rachel. That totally like my bias towards you must do everything <laughs> in the STEM field is 100% coming out here. But got to respect those humanities, as I say, and I say that as a former humanities student myself. Yes, likewise. I also want to call out the science internship program this student has been doing this past summer. Uh, this is a really great hands-on research experience at, where students get to work under a professor on actual college level research and great potential for a letter of recommendation from the professor and to see what does university level research look like. Uh, for some students, it means they run completely the opposite direction from college level research and are like, yes, I wanna go into industry. Um, for others, this is a really great way to uh, kind of pinpoint that that's uh, a pathway you might want to go on in the future. And again, a great research um, or a great opportunity for a letter of recommendation and 
a nice extension of the uh, the passion project the student has been doing around neural networks improving traffic in their town. Um, I love I love when students look around their local area, identify a problem or a topic or an issue, and then take the academic subjects that they're interested in and figure out a solution. Um, I think that's sometimes the hardest part of navigating high school and figuring out, okay, what do I want to be when I grow up? Um, but when you can kind of identify that topic or that issue in your local area and, and fuse that with the things that you're really passionate about, um, some really, really wonderful things come out of it. I noticed that the student also expressed an interest in Princeton, Columbia, uh, Brown, and Hopkins, as we mentioned. So obviously these are wildly selective institutions with very different curricula. So I was looking at it thinking, you know, how is the student going to make a case for both the rigid core curriculum at a school like Columbia University and then the open curriculum at Brown. So I think one of the things that I would want to understand from the student is how would they utilize um, an open curriculum like at Brown, cherry picking and sort of building um, an academic experience that's going to uniquely support their, their goals and aspirations. And then in contrast, how would Columbia's pretty robust humanities core really support that interest in biochemistry and position them for the best success in what their goals are after graduation, or at least for their academic um, you know, experience as well. So it's, it's thinking about that why our school essay that you're going to inevitably encounter, and how do you make a really compelling case for why these schools in particular are going to uniquely support your academic needs. How do we feel about the list itself and maybe other schools that the student might not have thought of since, you know, profile-wise, we can talk a little bit more about their admissibility as well. But are there schools that you think they're missing or that might be of interest to them? One school that came to mind, I had a student accepted to this last year, is uh, the University of Michigan's Urban Technology Program. It's actually within the School of Architecture and Planning, but is a very, very cool program that's using a lot of sort of AI and neural networks to think about how to improve transportation systems within cities. And so I thought that might be a really cool fit. Certainly University of Michigan is not a, a likely or a target for anyone, um, but another great one to add onto the list. You know, for me, Case Western came to mind as a school that has a pretty profound history of innovation and impactful um, scientific research. So, I, and it also has a little bit of a higher acceptance rate than some of the other schools on their list. Eric, were there any other schools that popped into your mind from the students' interests? Yeah, I don't know. I wondered if something like um, a liberal arts college would make sense for them if they were willing to you know, investigate colleges that have historically not necessarily been known for their hardcore sciences, but that have been really shoring up those departments, I don't know, um, somewhere like a Wesleyan or even like a Babson, if they were looking really into that entrepreneurial element where they're getting, again, like that's so heavily business focused. But I wondered if, you know, biochemistry is so narrow and students often change their mind. So if we pivoted that to just more of like this entrepreneurial element, since the idea of solving traffic is a really multidisciplinary um, area of study, I wondered if a liberal arts college might support them as well in their aspirations. I don't know. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I think that can be a really great fit, especially, you know, knowing that the student wants to come to the U.S. and is really seeking the, the perks of U.S. higher education, where you get to explore a lot of things and look for the connections between different disciplines and change your mind as many times as you want and still graduate in four years. And we have plenty of cities that are also struggling with traffic, so that would be really helpful to have that, you know, experience. And I don't know, when they graduate, they'll have plenty of work here in the States as well in our mega cities. Yes. So there's one thing I wanted to suggest for the student to consider. Um, I love that they list playing in a rock band as an extracurricular, as a hobby, and I wondered if they might want to uh, almost formalize that a little bit and perhaps use some of the proceeds from a show to um, buy robotics equipment, which is, I think, something that they're doing already. So that way they can really list and share the time commitment in kind of um, playing music, playing in a band, and then also relating it back to their interests. So I think that would be something to consider. I love that. I also think it brings a really interesting non-academic dimension, but it's still in the vaguely academic arena, right? This is a perfect opportunity for a student to 
talk about something that they really care about in one of the supplemental essays that might have nothing to do with biochemistry. And I often tell my students, they don't have to always try to sound impressive in their application because the transcript is gonna speak for itself, the rigor of their courses, their teacher recommendations. That's where a lot of the intellectual heft comes, in my opinion. And so they can use those other areas of the application to add a little bit of texture and a little bit more personality and not necessarily have to spend all of their time trying to do that hardcore academic you know, um, presentation. I don't know, Katie, you worked at a pretty hardcore academic institution. So while that may be true for some colleges, my suggestion, I don't know, is that is that necessarily true for all schools? Yeah, I think from the MIT perspective, I would love to see the student take their, they're already to some extent doing this, um, take their passion and love of STEM and sharing it with other students. So they've been doing a lot of fundraising to create STEM opportunities for younger kids. And I wonder if, um, similar to Rachel's suggestion of formalizing that a little bit is putting on a hackathon or creating a maker fair at their high school. Um, I've seen students do that time and time again, and I love to see that as an MIT admissions officer when students were taking, you know, that thing that they're passionate about academically and then sharing that with the community and getting other little kids just as excited about robots and Raspberry Pi and Scratch programming or building a giant like Knex robot. Um, or connects roller coaster or something like that. Um, so I think there's a lot of cool opportunities to uh, not only celebrate the STEM opportunities that you enjoy as a student, but share them with others at your school. I mean, this is a great student. And just in terms of strict academic profile too, I mean, the colleges that they're looking at, you know, the Ivies, if, the, if Stanford and MIT end up elevating as top choices to the student, you know, there are going to be liabilities. Rachel and Katie talked about some of the academic choices that maybe would raise a little, you know, some eyebrows. And I wonder if, you know, maybe the student could even, it's not too late to supplement their coursework or ex potentially accelerate um, that math track potentially, I don't know where they are in their journey. And then also regrettably, with so many more schools reinstituting the testing requirement, the student may even want to prepare for an additional SAT. It's something that I hate to say, um, but given the 1490 and where the student might fall in that bottom quartile for some of these upper tier schools, I don't know, is that a suggestion you might have thoughts on, um, whether that's supplementing the academic coursework or does, does the student need to sit for the SAT or ACT again? So for this student coming in at a 1490, I'd really love to see that nudged a little bit over the, uh, the 1500 mark. Um, any kind of my general advice to students for especially schools like an MIT, like a Stanford, a Johns Hopkins, a Harvard, you really want to be in that sort of 1550 range. And that's going to just tell the admissions officer, okay, cool, you got the scores and they can move on from that versus wondering, mm, is this student going to be able to handle the academic work? Let me look really closely at the other academic record that I have to go on. Um, but with the, the lack of math at the A levels, um, I do think it would be helpful to, to potentially take on like a Johns Hopkins Center for Talented Youth uh, calculus course, like a, you could do AP Calculus BC, you could do Honors Calculus. If you really, really love math, you could go on and do a multivariable or a differential equations, depending on sort of how advanced the student is in math. Um, those are things that I think can show to a college your willingness to kind of go above and beyond. Um, and the, the intellectual curiosity to go and learn those things that maybe you aren't getting in the, the limitations of the British curriculum. That's great advice. Yeah, I think, you know, regrettably, we encounter a lot of students who are interested in the most highly selective colleges. And these are where you are splitting those kinds of hairs, right? In the committee room, you're saying, oh, multivariable calculus was available to the student. They didn't quite get there. And then you're up against all these other students who have that and more. And that 1550, I mean, that's such a high mark. So I would also encourage the student to really try to find some schools that are in a more forgiving range of selectivity that also share some of the qualities and characteristics of the Princeton, Columbia, Brown, Hopkins that they expressed interest in. So that would be our challenge, you know, in working together um, with, with developing that rapport and figuring out the other schools that are going to be palatable. And then we'd ultimately decide a strategic and early decision or early action plan if applicable. Is this is a student where if their scores didn't improve and their curriculum was cemented, I would 
probably encourage them to maybe look at schools that are at a more forgiving range of selectivity while still highly selective and still supporting their academic goals, um, but that might be more realistic in terms of admission. If we're speaking in terms that we use pretty readily, you'll hear the reach, likely, and target range schools, right? So for this student, they've expressed an interest in some of the most highly selective colleges in the country. That's the Ivy, Stanford, MIT, and by extension, I would include places like the University of Chicago, Duke, Vanderbilt, WashU, Northwestern, and some of kind of the usual suspects, right, that are at 10% or admit or below. Those are always going to fit into the reach category for students, and for some of them, they may even be out of reach given their academic profile. The target range is a school where the student falls within range of what's typical for an admitted student and that usually falls on those quantitative benchmarks like GPA, rigor of curriculum, and test scores if available. The likely designation is reserved for colleges where the student is at or above the admitted student profile for what's typical year over year, and that's where I would have a high degree of comfort where this student would be admitted. And they would not only be admitted, but likely even offered, awarded, offered or awarded um, substantial merit-based scholarships to try to incentivize them to come. So it's a highly individualized conversation, but those are three categories that you'll often hear um, us use as counselors when we're advising students on where to apply. So that's just a small sample of how we work with students in helping you to develop your profile, to tell your story. And if you'd like to dive in even deeper, uh, reach out to us and get some support from all of us here at Ivy Wise in crafting your best application and applying to college. Contact Ivy Wise today to learn more about our services, including our signature roundtable, which simulates the real-world admissions committee evaluation process.